I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Thank you for that beautiful song. I now turn to our gospel lesson found in John chapter 17. I share with you verses 6 through 11. Hear now these words, this prayer from our Lord and Savior. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O holy God, may the words of my mouth, may the thoughts resting upon each one of our heart and minds. May they all be acceptable to you, you who are today and forever our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The time is evening. The shadows of dusk are setting on the city, the ancient city of Jerusalem. The shopkeepers are have closed their shops for the day. The sellers in the marketplace have collected their wares and left for home. The city has grown quiet as people have gathered in their homes to eat their evening meal. In a room on the upper floor of a house, we find Jesus gathered together with his 12 disciples. He knows that his time with them is coming to an end. And he is sharing in a last meal, a special Passover meal with those who have been his closest companions for the past three years. Jesus speaks, sharing with them the sad news that he must leave them. Of course, they neither understand nor want to hear it. As the evening continues, we discover that Jesus is deeply concerned, deeply concerned about something that is not what awaits him on the cross. He looks at the 12 men in that room with him, and what he sees is the very real possibility of misunderstanding, of disagreement, and the kind of conflict that could tear them apart. So far, a deep and overriding commitment to and love for him has kept that diverse group together even at those times when disagreements threatened to divide them. But what was going to happen when he was no longer with them? Would they be arguing all the time at each other's throats, unable to fulfill their mission? Now, Jesus had good reason to be concerned. There was Matthew the former tax collector whose career choice had caused others around the table to consider him basically a traitor, a traitor to all that he had done. 
to all that he was. There was Simon the Zealot with his fierce, very fierce revolutionary tendencies and hatred of tax collectors and everything having to do with them and Rome. There was Peter and his tendency to react to a situation before thinking it through. There were James and John who wanted to be Jesus' favorites and who had made known their personal ambition of attaining positions of power and influence in Jesus' coming kingdom. In those moments in the upper room, Jesus looks at those who were his closest friends, and he is profoundly concerned that, that there's going to be times when they are just pulling apart, when they are unable to work together when he is gone. Realizing the presence of tension and the possibility of turmoil, Jesus prays for his disciples. It is a long prayer, but part of that prayer is this sentence. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus prays for unity among his disciples because without it, they will not fulfill the difficult but glorious destiny to which Jesus had called them to. For it was up to that small group to spread Jesus' message of love and salvation throughout the world. Power struggles, division, bickering among the disciples after Jesus' death would have been disastrous for the early church. Actually, division and bickering within Christ's church is still disastrous. Whenever people can't seem to work together and spend much of their time disagreeing, the message and the ministry of Christ always suffers. Several years ago, there was a National Geographic feature. It, it was produced, and it was about um, mux oxen as well as arctic wolves. And the author described how a seven-member pack of Arctic wolves had targeted several musk oxen calves who were guarded by 11 adults. As the wolves approached the musk oxen, they sort of bunched together in a circle like this. Maybe you've seen it before on some kind of a special. And it's sort of an impenetrable circle. And they guard those calves in the middle. Well, their deadly hoofs and their horns are pretty successful at doing this. They are able to fend off the wolves during what is a fairly long standoff, and the calves remain safe. But all of a sudden, a single ox broke rank, and then the rest of the herd panicked, and they started scattering, running off. Eventually, the adults fled completely, and the calves were led behind, and they became prey to the wolves. In nature, as well as in human society, unity creates a strength that does not exist when standing alone. Sometimes that strength is used by gathered mobs for hurtful and hateful and destructive purposes, like what happened at our U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. on January 6. But at other times, United strength is used for helpful and saving purposes. Think of how people pull together in response to those experiencing a personal tragedy or impacted by a natural or community disaster. Just recently, following Hurricane Ida, communities pulled together and neighbors helped rescue and lend a hand to devastated neighbors. People who live far away from those impacted areas donated money to organizations like the Red Cross and the United Methodist Committee on Relief because of their desire, our desire, to pitch in and to help in some way in the midst of their tragedy. This is unity at its best. And thankfully, even at a disturbingly divisive time, such as this time in which we are currently living, we are occasionally blessed with a glimpse 
of the impact, the blessedness of unity. At the time when the Gospel of John was written, it was about 50 years after Jesus' death. And Christians were already recognizing the significance of Jesus' prayer for unity. At that time, the initial diversity of Jesus' followers, who had simply been a diverse group of individuals all raised in the same Jewish faith. But it had grown significantly greater as the church had grown and spread. Paul's significant impact on on others, on, on reaching out and reaching that Gentile population meant that followers of Jesus were no longer a small religious group within the Jewish population. In fact, Gentiles were beginning to outnumber those of Jewish heritage. This growing diversity was not bad. It was clearly God's plan, a plan laid out by Jesus when he said to the disciples, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And yet, with greater diversity came greater conflict. In every one of Paul's New Testament letters, he is addressing some type of disagreement or division that was happening among that particular group of Christians. To the church in Ephesus, he wrote, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Scripture regularly emphasizes our common heritage as children of God and our common purpose as followers of Christ. But instead of focusing on that which we have in common, we so often focus on our differences with eyes that are distorted by fear and distrust and dislike. We obsess about the differences until they are all that we see. I think too many people confuse uniformity of belief and practice with unity in Christ. We forget that Jesus was making a very important point when he gathered together what was a very diverse group of disciples. Like those first disciples, we do not always have to agree on various issues to be one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. These words are in our communion communion liturgy, and you'll hear them soon. The strength of our unity has and always will be found in Christ and not in our ability to agree on everything. This is a point that is so easy for us to forget when we are digging in and insisting that one particular way, our way, is the only right way. Jesus challenged a lot of people in his day when it came to their understanding of God and the way in which they should be living. He especially confronted the self-righteous Pharisees and scribes because they were exactly the kind of people who saw everything in terms of black or white, right or wrong, their way or the highway. A very similar, I think, self-righteous attitude is unfortunately thriving in our polarized society today. I can't imagine Jesus any less concerned and condemning of such thinking and behaving. I know I have mentioned at different times my past participation in two out-of-country mission trips, one to Mexico, one to Russia. There are really significant differences in the way our Christian brothers and sisters worship in Mexico and Russia. 
very different parts of the world. And yet, despite the language barriers and my personal discomfort with some of the worship practices, what I remember and what I treasure most is the profound sense of oneness in Christ that I felt while there with them. Of course, you don't have to leave the country to see the diversity. If you are someone who has a yellow pages that you still look at at home, open it up to churches. I'm thinking the majority of us are more likely to Google local churches. But either way, what you will discover is a lengthy list of different Christian denominations and churches. Diverse people with a common purpose and a willingness to work together have not always been our tendency as Christians. Differences, differences in scriptural interpretation have too often divided us in the past and they continue to divide us now. And we might as well admit that differences in personalities and just sometimes nasty stubbornness and bickering have also impacted many congregations. But because a small group of first century Christ followers put aside their differences and their personal aspirations, their stubbornness and self-righteousness, and fully committed themselves to Jesus Christ, they were able to transform the known world of the day. Their unity of spirit, their unity in living and sharing Christ's love inspired others. And within a few years, that small group had grown immensely. And even their enemies began referring to them as those people who have been turning the world upside down. As a result, millions upon millions of people around the world this morning call themselves Christians. These millions of Christians are gathered together into thousands upon thousands of churches as well as thousands upon thousands of homes thanks to technology. Wherever and however Christians happen to be worshiping across the world today, we are united by our songs of praise, our prayers of thanks to a God who made himself known to us in Jesus Christ. Our worshiping numbers may not be what they used to be, but if we take into account those of you gathered here in person and those of you gathered virtually, the number is significantly more than 12. So what might the Lord be able to do with us in this small part of the world if we would but all unite in a spirit of purpose? What might the Lord accomplish if each one of us used the gifts God has given us to both strengthen Christ's church and to be about Christ's kingdom work, the work of love and reconciliation in our community? Unfortunately, we are living at a time more characterized by polarization, by finger pointing, than by unity. Unity is always difficult. It has been difficult throughout the centuries. It is always difficult when I'm right and she's wrong, when I'm good and he's bad when my point is more valid than your point. So how are you at putting aside differences in order to focus on the unity of purpose that Christ has called us to in his great commission, his great commandment to love? I sure hope you are looking to Jesus as your example and not to some of our sinfully divisive political leaders and partisan commentators. For even now, I believe Jesus is praying for us. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. 
as we seek to be the church in a world of such great diversity and huge divisions, as we strive to be a faithful congregation in the midst of differing personalities, opinions, political affiliations, and scriptural interpretations, let us be ever mindful of Jesus' prayer of unity for us. Let us be one with Christ and one with each other that the world may know the one who chose sacrifice instead of taking up arms against his enemies. The one who suffered enormously yet forgave those responsible. And the one who rose on that third day that sinners like us might also be raised to new life.